last of the Bergman Space uh, talks by Stefan Richter at the University of Tennessee. Stefan. All right. Good morning, everybody. So let me start by trying to share my uh, my slides. Um, I made a beginner's mistake uh, this time. I uh, I had some. Um, I remembered something early this morning that I had actually wanted to put into the, the slides into the talk, and so I made some changes. And uh, so as a result, well, first of all, I probably won't be able to to finish all my slides. That's that's okay. I'll just stop when the time's up. But uh, hopefully I, I don't have too many typos in there and I need you guys to, to keep me honest and make sure that uh, everything I say is still still true. All right, so let's uh, today we want to talk about Bergman inner functions and uh, let's uh, take a look back at the Hardy spaces. So if P is between one and infinity and we have an invariant subset, we always just worry about the Banner space, well, not always, but we do worry about the Banner space situation mostly. Um, if um, if we take an invariant subspace in the Hardy class HP, then it's of the type phi times HP for some inner function phi. All right, so how does the proof of this go? So first of all, uh, you look at Berling's paper, he does the proof for P equals two. Uh, you, you look at this uh, M minus CM, so M is your invariant subspace. Yesterday I talked about uh, that M minus CM is not equal to zero when uh, when m is uh, is not zero, and so we take a function of norm one in there, and then uh, we uh, use the fact that uh, when n is positive, z to the n phi is in in z m, and so it's orthogonal to phi, and so that gives us zero. And when I write out in terms of that uh, uh, l two integral, then I see that uh, the integral of z to the n phi squared is is zero, and so that means the the well, Fourier coefficients of phi squared are, are zero for for all n. I can take complex conjugates of this; it's still zero, and uh, except for n equals zero, and that means that um, phi squared has to be one almost everywhere. So phi is a classical inner function, and then once you know that, you finish the proof and show that m is equal equal to phi times h two. And then in Berling's paper, he says um, a similar argument shows uh, the result for uh, for other values of p. Now, I, I'm not going to argue with uh, what Berling meant by, by that, but what I would do if, uh, if I were to prove this uh, for other values of P is, let's say we take P equals 1, then um, the spaces get smaller as the index increases. So I take an invariant subspace in H1, I intersect it with H2, and now I have an invariant that turns out to be close in H2, and it's invariant. And so I have it that it's that's equal to phi times h2. Now I have my inner function, and then I work and show that that actually works. And so that proves is nice because it works. And uh, you know I don't know whether that's what Berling had in mind. It doesn't look like a similar proof to me. It just looks like we're using the Hilbert space uh, situation. Okay, so uh, now let's go to the Bergman space. So if we are in p equals two. Uh, again, we can. Uh, it's perfectly natural now to look at m minus z m and take a unit vector in there. And as before, we get now that the integral z to the n phi squared dA is equal to zero for all positive values of n. So, so that looks sort of very similar to what we had before. But now, if we're in L one a, then we know there are L one zero sets, L one a zero sets that are not zero sets for L two a. So when I look at the zero-based invariant subspace inside of L1a, then that's non-zero. But when I take the intersection with L2a, uh, then I get zero. So right off the bat, as I go from p equals 2 to other values of p, what I did there before, which worked kind of nicely, is, is never going to work. Well, I let that not uh, deter me much. I, uh, I still use this as, as my definition for an LPA in a function, and we'll see in a while that uh, that is a good definition. So, a function in uh, in LPA is called LPA inner if it has norm one, and if its integral uh, with z to the n and phi to the p is equal to zero for all n bigger than zero. So, of course, I can take complex conjugates of this, and I also get uh, get zero, but I don't get zero when I take something of the type integral z bar to the k um, z to the n times phi to the p, or at least I don't know. And also, while I did know that for p equals 2, 
uh, for every invariant subspace, there's going to be lots of these, or at least for every invariant subspace, there's at least one such function. Over here, I don't know anything about the existence. So when P is, say, 3 over 2, and um, I take an invariant subspace uh, with, uh, with lots of zeros, well, I don't know that I can take two over pth roots, and I don't know that any such functions will exist, or many such functions exist. Of course, if I have a function over here in the two situation uh, that has no zeros, then I can take uh, some sort of a pth root or some, of something, and then I get a function that satisfies this. So I, I know there are some of these, but I don't know that there are a lot of them. Okay, so for that, I uh, consider an extremal problem. So I take an invariant subspace in LP, and now there's always a little tedious extra argument that one has to do if all the functions in the invariant subspace have a zero at the origin. So I will, in my, my proofs, I will always assume that that's not the case. So it, it, there's always a function in the invariant subspace that's not zero at the origin. Okay, now I consider this extremal problem. I'm trying to maximize the value of, uh, the absolute value of f of zero given that the norm of f is equal to 1, or I look at this ratio here. And that's obviously the same as the infimum of its reciprocal. So the supremum of, of this ratio here is the same as uh, when I take 1 over uh, the infimum of the reciprocal. And uh, so I have uh, two extremal problem here, a supremum problem and an infimum problem, but they're really the same problems. And, uh, a function will solve uh, this first problem if the function solves the second problem, because that's the exact same problem except just the reciprocals. Okay, well now this uh, this has a problem that uh, the anything that solves this, then a multiple of it will also solve it. So I, I want to do a normalization, and so I do the normalization. So I take now functions of norm one, and I maximize the real part of these functions. And then uh, that's the same as taking the 1 over the infimum of the norms, uh, given that uh, the value uh, at 0 should be 1. Okay, so then I can say that either both of these problems have a solution or neither, because, you know, when I get one solution, I get the other. And now because I did different normalizations here, uh, either the solution to both problems exists and is unique, or... Um, well, that's the case for neither of the two problems. So if I have a unique solution to the, to the soup problem, I have a unique solution to the inf problem, and if I have a unique solution to the inf problem, I have a unique solution to the soup problem. And so any solution to the soup problem is what I'll now call an extremal function for m. All right, so now I've written, written down the inf extremal problem here, because with this one, it's very nice to see that the set I'm taking the inf over, h and m, h of 0 is equal to 1, that's a convex set. And so in a strictly convex uh, reflexive Banach space, uh, convex sets uh, have a unique function where the infimum is attained. So for p between 1 and infinity, extremal functions exist and are unique. If p is equal to 1, then L1a is still strictly convex, so uniqueness still holds, but apparently uh, existence for, for general invariant subspaces is, is an open question. Um, and for p between 0 and 1, I, I don't know at all in, in all generality. And, uh, but fortunately, uh, even in, in these uh, exceptional cases here, uh, for the invariant subspaces that we might be interested in most cases, ex uh, extremal functions uh, uh, exist and uniqueness is known, uh, so when uh, M is uh, a cyclically generated invariant subspace, the smallest invariant subspace that contains the function F, or a zero-based invariant subspace. So for example, let me show the existence of the, of the zero-based invariant subspaces. So let's say we have a, uh, we want to achieve the infimum here, so we take a sequence of functions Hn, which is 1 at the origin and is in M, and uh, their norms converge to the, the infimum. Um, then the ball in the spaces is a normal family, so there'll be a locally um, uniformly convergent subsequence um, that converges to some analytic function, and then uh, by Fatou's lemma, that um, that function will be LP integrable, and because it's a limit 
of functions that have all these zeros at the point lambda n, since it's locally uniform limit, the limit will also have those zeros. So the limit function is in LPA and it has the right zeros, and so it's an I of lambda. So the existence really doesn't depend on, on P for these um, zero-based invariant subspaces. Okay, so, uh, and it's now an exercise uh, to prove that uh, for classical inner functions in the HP situation, if you know the invariant subspace is uh, phi times HP, then the phi is the unique solution, the extremal function for the invariant subspace. All right, in the, in the Bergman space, uh, one can show that uh, if, uh, if you start out with uh, an LPA invariant subspace and you have an extremal function, uh, then it's an LPA in a function. So that means, uh, remember, the integral z to the n phi to the p is, is 0 for n bigger than 0. If uh, p is equal to 2, then uh, functions to this extremal problem, solutions to this extremal problem, have to be in m minus zm. Even uh, when this space is infinite dimensional, uh, solutions to the extremal problem are going to be in there. And I just uh, sh showed you that there's a unique solution. So there's lots of solutions perhaps in here if the index is infinite, but only one uh, will solve the extremal problem. All right, so proof for p equals 2 is, is so for example, I take uh, a function in m. Uh, it's 1 at, uh, at that point. And then I write it as a function in m minus zm plus a function in zm. And uh, then I look at the Pythagorean theorem that tells me that the norm of F, the norm of f squared is greater than or equal to the norm of, of the term in, in uh, m minus zm. And uh, in this case, of course, when, when it's like this, the function zm is 0 at the origin. So f of 0 and g of 0 take the same value. And so the f has a larger norm. So when I'm looking for the infimum of the norms over the functions that have absolute value 1 that, or 1 at that point, then the g is a better candidate than the f. And so uh, extremal functions will have to be in m minus cm. If p is not equal to 2, then one uses a, a little variational argument, and that starts out as follows. So you look, you take a complex number a that's less than 1. So a minus, uh, 1 plus a times c to the n, uh, quantity absolute value to the p, I can write as 1 plus a z to the n to the p over 2, quantity squared, and this is analytic, so I can, and the binomial series converges, so I write down the first couple of terms of the binomial series. Now I use the, the absolute value squared and write that out, so I get 1 plus p times the real part of a z to the n plus big O of absolute a squared. And then I go back to what I'm trying to prove here, so I'm trying to prove that if I have a solution to the extremal problem, it's LPA inner, and I ran out of space on the slide, but uh, here I have a function 1 plus a times z to the n times phi that takes the same value as phi at, at the origin. And phi minimizes the value at the origin, so this expression is positive. Uh, and now I write down the integrals for this and I use this formula and, you know, I play around with the, with the a and I get that uh, the phi will satisfy the LPA inner condition. So, so that's a fairly simple variational argument there. All right, so that means that now every invariant subspace contains some LPA in a function if, if I have a, a solution. So in all cases, P between 1 and infinity, I have that. All right, now uh, you can calculate some of these. So if uh, P is between 0 and infinity, and we look at the invariant subspace of all functions that vanish at one point, then Ozipenko and Stesson and Duren Carvinson, Shapiro and Sandberg have calculated what these functions are. So they're not very simple, but they're also not very complicated. So we're, but we're just looking at one, at one zero here. So there's a, a zero at the point lambda, the, the Blaschke factor here, lambda minus c over one minus lambda bar z. So that's zero at z equals lambda, like that function should be. And then I guess the only thing I want you to take away here is that um, this extra factor is, is never equal to zero in the disk because uh, one minus lambda times uh, this expression um, will have positive real part, and so 1 plus something with positive real part is n has positive real part, so that's never equal to 0. And then um, the, the constant here 
is uh, something that depends on lambda and on p. And anyway, so uh, for p is equal to 2, um, it turns out these functions are always, uh, you see the 2 over p there cancels out, and they are always just rational functions. And in fact, they are linear combinations of reproducing kernels. And even if you take uh, invariant subspaces of uh, the type where you take finitely many zeros, and you look at all the functions that are zero at those uh, finitely many zeros, then the extremal functions will be linear combinations of reproducing kernels and, and the constant function one. And so they'll be analytic in the neighborhood of the disk. So you have some smoothness, at least for those functions with finitely many zeros. Now Sandberg shows that uh, that's also true for other values of P. So for any value of P, if you take a finite subset of the disk and you calculate the unique extremal function for this invariant subspace, then it's analytic in the neighborhood of the closed unit disk. All right, and now here's the, the first big theorem about uh, the extremal functions for some of the invariant subspaces. So if you take a invariant subspaces of LPA, then either if the invariant subspace is a, a zero-based invariant subspace or it's cyclically generated by some uh, LPA in a function. Then it turns out that you can divide out the LPA in a function, f over phi, uh, for any function f in the invariant subspace m. If f is in m, then f over phi is in LPA, and it satisfies this contractive inequality. And perhaps easier to, to visualize what's going on is that when you take the functions in m, you multiply them by phi, then you stay in LPA. There's also this inclusion here that HP is always contained in m over phi. I'll show that to you in a minute. That's actually uh, somewhat trivial. So, so anyway, so you have this nice inclusion that if you take a invariant subspace of one of these types here, then it lies between HP and LPA. Let's contrast that with the situation in HP and the Dirichlet space. So when we're in HP, of course, when we uh, take the L invariant subspace of phi over HP, we take this ratio here, we always get equality and the, we have an isometric uh, division property there. So they're isometric divisors, the functions phi. If you take the Dirichlet space, then it turned out that if you take these uh, Dirichlet inner functions, so to speak, um, they're contractive multipliers and uh, you get this inequality, this inclusion of spaces that the Dirichlet space is contained in M over phi and is contained in H2. So it's the inequalities and inclusions are just the opposite uh, to what they are in the Bergman situation. All right, so as a corollary, um, let me prove or, or indicate the proofs of, of a few things now. So these uh, um, LPA inner functions are actually characterized by various different conditions. So the following four conditions are equivalent. I'm, again, I'm assuming phi of zero is positive. Uh, and uh, that the LPA, that the function is LPA inner. It's an extremal function for the invariant subspace it generates. It satisfies this contractive divisor property for all functions in this bracket phi, or it satisfies this contractive multiplier property that it multiplies HP into LP. So that uh, the, the Bergman LP norm of phi times F is less than the HP norm of f, or you could say another way of saying is if you think of this as an integral, is that phi to the PDA is a Carlson measure, uh, a traditional Carlson measure for, for the Hardy space. All right, so the implication one implies three, that was the previous theorem that LPA inner function have this contractive divisor property. So I'm, I'm gonna say something about that in a minute. Let me prove that uh, three implies two. So uh, for any function, uh, absolute value phi of zero is less than or equal to its norm, and the norm was equal to one is what we assumed. If we now take a function f in the um, bracket phi uh, of norm one, then uh, it's when I divide through by phi, so I'm assuming part three here that I am in the space, and so that satisfies that uh, its value at zero is less than its norm. Then I'm assuming three, I have the contractive uh, property, and I'm assuming that the norm is equal to one. So I get f of zero over phi of zero is less than or equal to one. And so um, f is less than or equal to phi of zero. 
So again, the value at five zero is larger than the value of f at zero. So phi is a better so, uh, candidate for the extremal problem to maximize the value at zero among the functions of norm one. So uh, three implies two. And then um, uh, two implies uh, one was the uh, earlier uh, theorem already. And so let's uh, connect four to this. So we want to look at uh, uh, f times phi in the p integral. So here's uh, f uh, to the p times phi to the p. Now, f to the p is subharmonic. It's smaller than its least harmonic majorant, which is the Poisson integral of uh, f to the p. All right, well, now we use uh, what I'd mentioned earlier, that the sweep of this measure um, f to the p dA is actually uh, the integral against uh, Lebesgue measure. Or maybe I forgot to mention that earlier. But um, in any case, uh, that's the property uh, that it's a LPA in a function. That uh, it, uh, when you integrate against harmonic functions, you get the same as if you integrate Lebesgue measure against the boundary values of that harmonic function. And so that's f to the p. And so that's, uh, that's the HP norm of f. So you get the inequality that I had here. And then the implication four implies one is, a, is another variation, a variational argument uh, with this uh, one plus a times z to the n to the p, just like what I did earlier. So, so I'll skip that. So, so that's, uh, that's nice. So we have four conditions that are equivalent to being LPA in f functions. The proof, uh, so I didn't say earlier, this um, theorem was uh, proven by uh, Hayden-Malm in the case p equals two, and then by Dorn, Havinson, uh, Shapiro, and Sandberg uh, for the other cases of p. And what they did is, uh, is a beautiful connection uh, to the uh, harmonic or biharmonic uh, function in the, in the disk. And I don't have enough uh, space here or time uh, to do all the details, but uh, what's important there is that when you look at the function phi to the p minus one, then the fact that it's Bergman in us means that it annihilates all the uh, continuous harmonic functions in the disk that are continuous on the up to the boundary. And then if you know that, then it turns out that uh, phi to the p minus one is the Laplacian of some function uh, u uh, that is uh, positive in the disk and uh, zero and has normal derivative zero on the boundary. And the way that works is, so you would start out, you would say, well, so we start out with phi to the p minus one, and then we take the green potential of, of this function, and then we get a function u whose Laplacian is equal to phi and the u uh, is equal to zero on the boundary. And now we use the fact that phi to the p minus one is orthogonal to the harmonic functions. And that tells us then after some calculations that the um, normal derivative of the u will also have to be uh, zero on the boundary. And then once you have u and its normal derivative are both zero on the boundary, then uh, you know that um, u is equal to uh, the bi the the biharmonic function integrated against the bi Laplacian of, of u. And uh, the bi Laplacian of u is the same as phi to the p. And so you, I get this form u is the integral of the bi Laplacian, bi harmonic function uh, against the Laplacian of phi to the p. I know that went a little quick here, but it turns out the bi, bi harmonic function is known and is positive in the disk. Phi to the p is subharmonic, so the Laplacian is positive. So the u is positive and it satisfies its zero and its partial derivative are zero on the boundary. Now, of course, I'm assuming it's smooth on the boundary. So, you know, in the case when it's not, uh, one has to do a little bit of extra work. But I did tell you that for at least for finite zero sets, um, that is the case. And now if I look at, uh, I want to first prove that uh, Q times phi has larger norm than, uh, than Q for a polynomial Q. So I look at the LP norm of Q phi to the P and subtract um, the LP norm of Q. So I write that down as integrals. I factor out the Q to the P. Now phi to the P minus one is Laplacian of U. Now I use Green's theorem. I can put the Laplacian on the other side. So I have U times Laplacian of Q to the P. And then I get boundary terms, but the boundary terms are zero because of the properties of U. So I get this expression, U is positive. Laplacian of the subharmonic function is positive again, and so the expression is positive. And so uh, multiplication by phi expands the norm and 
um, that tells me that, for example, if I apply that to functions f in bracket phi, so say, for example, f a polynomial q times phi, then here the phi cancels out, and I get q times phi over here. That's just the expansive multiplier property. So I get it for a dense set in bracket phi, and so I get this property by taking limits for all functions in bracket phi. And then to do it for the um, zero-based invariant subspaces, it's, it's a little extra work, but uh, it can be done. All right, so it's a good theorem, so I've stated here for the third time. Um, I wanted to now say what, uh, with Alexandru Alleman, Carl Sandberg, and I, what we proved uh, to improve this theorem a little bit uh, by um, extending the, the range of invariant subspaces that, uh, that it applies to. And in fact, what we showed is that if you take any invariant subspace with LPA inner function or extremal function uh, phi, and um, if it's either uh, a zero-based invariant subspace or if it's a cyclic subspace, and now not just generated by the phi, but generated by any function, then it's in fact generated by the, by the extremal function. So before in the theorem up there, we just had only for the extremal functions, you could take this invariant subspace. And so that's an important uh, step that, in fact, it works for all uh, of these type of invariant subspace. So, so for all of the cyclic invariant subspaces or zero-based subspaces, they're generated by their extremal function. If P is equal to two, we actually know that uh, the analogous statement holds for invariant subspace of uh, index bigger than one, uh, but in uh, in the other cases where P is not two, we have no clue what to, how to even start uh, to prove something uh, similar. And, and in this talk, I won't pursue any of this. All right, now as an analog, as a corollary to this statement, we get an inner outer factorization for functions in LPA. So um, what I can do here is I can start out with a function in LPA, and I can look at its, uh, the, I can look at bracket G, and I look at the extremal um, function for that, uh, that bracket G. And then by the previous theorem, I know that bracket G equals bracket phi. And uh, by the Hinmam uh, theorem, or by the Duren, Havinson, Shapiro, and Sandberg theorem, I know for I know the contractive uh, divisor property now for all the functions in there because these brackets spaces are the same. And uh, so when I, in particular, when I take the function f to be uh, the function g that's that's in here, then uh, that's in the space. And uh, this function h g over phi is in LPA. And it satisfies that its norm is smaller than that. And uh, it uh, is easy to check that uh, this inequality, the fourth inequality that I have here, is uh, satisfied just by this, this inequality. And uh, the function uh, uh, phi, has, of course, uh, phi times h is equal to g. So this satisf if satisfied, 2 satisfied. And let me show you that 3 is satisfied also. So, since phi is in bracket g, there exists a sequence of polynomials such that q and g converges to phi. And then uh, when I look at uh, q and h minus 1 in the p norm, I multiply and divide by, by phi. So I get uh, uh, g is equal to uh, phi times h. So I get this expression here, and I have the contractive divisor property. And I know that q and f converges to phi, so that goes to 0. So the Q and H converge to 1, and that means that H will have to be a cyclic function. The invariant subspace generated by H is the whole thing. All right, so that looks like it'd be nice theorem already if I only have the first three conditions, and the, third, uh, the fourth condition is a little technical. But the reason I have that is because the fourth condition determine the phi and the H uniquely up to a constant factor of modulus 1. Well, uh, Borachev and Henman proved that when you just have the first three conditions, then uh, uh, the, they're not uniquely satisf uh, uh, satisfied. In fact, there are LPA inner functions, no, LPA outer functions that have a LPA inner factorization. Or the other, I forget, okay. So anyway, so the, it's not uniquely uh, satisfied. All right, now the proof of our theorem here in the case uh, when, when P is not equal to 2 is again, again actually a Hilbert space proof. So what we do is 
we look at, uh, so we prove this for P equals two at first, and as, like I said here, we have a better result. And then um, for P not equal to two, we take the extremal function phi, and we look at phi to the P, and then we look at the L2 space with measure phi to the P dA. And then we do a Hilbert space proof, and then uh, we're somehow, uh, with all the structure that we already have in the LP, we're able to, to go back to the LP situation. So everybody always tries to use the Hilbert space uh, uh, approach first. And it turned out that uh, Shimoran has a very simple approach to Hilbert space situation. And so I want to explain uh, that now. Uh, so in fact, that works in, in somewhat more generality. So let me uh, review. Uh, so I know there's going to be a, a mini course on uh, reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces, um, but I need a few of those facts already. So let's assume that H is a Hilbert function space on some set X. By that I mean all the functions in, in H are uh, functions on X, and uh, point evaluations at each point uh, is a continuous linear functional. Uh, then I can represent evaluation at each point by a function in the space, by the Reese representation theorem for the Hilbert space, and that's when I evaluate that function at each uh, point, that k sub z of, of w, that's the reproducing kernel for, for the space. All right, here's an, another definition. If you take a set and a function of two variables on x cross x, complex valued, is called positive definite. If whenever you look at uh, this expression, you get something positive. So you take arbitrary collection of points in the set and you look at uh, uzi and uzj and you multiply this with uh, some arbitrarily chosen complex numbers a1 through an and get something positive so if you look at it carefully if you form the n by n matrix with entries uh, uzi of zj then what this condition is saying that this matrix is positive semi-definite so for every n the matrix that you get by evaluating at all these points uh, is a positive semi-definite matrix. That's uh, a positive definite kernel. So the important example is that if you take a reproducing kernel Hilbert space, its reproducing kernel is positive definite. Well, it's obvious that linear combination, finite linear combinations of reproducing kernels have positive norm. And if you write out what that means, is it's the inner product with itself. So I can take the sums out, finite sums, summation AI, AJ bar, in a product of KZI with KZJ, and that's just KZI evaluated at KZJ. So that's the U of ZI, ZJ. It's exactly this expression. So reproducing kernels are always positive, definite. And it's a theorem of Moore and Aronjan that says the converse is true also, that if you have a positive, definite function, then there's a unique Hilbert function space uh, with reproducing kernel U. And I'm actually not going to use that, but remembering that is sometimes uh, helpful. So, for example, if you take a reproducing kernel for a uh, reproducing kernel Hilbert space, you take the square of uh, kz at w, you, that's the inner product of kz with kw, the evaluation quantity squared. I use the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, and then I evaluate again. Uh, norm kz squared is kz inner product with kz, and same for w. So, I get this inequality for every reproducing kernel, and but every reproducing every positive definite function is um, is a reproducing kernel so so this inequality also holds for positive definite functions and I don't need to know what these norms are in inner products are in the middle all right one other thing about reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces is that finite linear combinations of reproducing kernels are dense in the space and that's easy to see because if you had a function that was orthogonal to all these finite linear combinations then it have to be orthogonal to each reproducing kernel, and so it would have to be zero at each point, and so it'd have to be the zero function. And so finite linear combinations of reproducing kernels are dense. And one more thing, if you take a subspace of a reproducing kernel Hilbert space, then uh, that subspace is another reproducing kernel Hilbert space. It's a Hilbert space, and it's, uh, it's a Hilbert function space, and so evaluations are continuous. So it has a reproducing kernel, and the reproducing kernel is given by the projection of the original reproducing kernel onto the subspace. And uh, it's easy to check. The projection, of course, is in the space. So for each z, pmkz is a function in the space. And when you take any function in m, 
then you take the inert product with F with PMKZ, then uh, because the F is an M, you don't need the projection here, so you evaluate. So, so that's the reproducing kernel for the subspace. All right, and now here's Jim Warren's absolutely amazing theorem, or it's a version of it, the version that I stated here is not the full generality, but it's a version that's best for my presentation. So let's take a arbitrary reproducing kernel Hilbert space on the unit disk that's actually consists of holomorphic functions. And suppose that uh, multiplication by Z is a bounded operator, that Z times the space is closed in Z. So that's going to be equivalent to saying that Z is bounded below. Multiplication by Z is bounded below. And I assume that uh, I have this index one property here, that the dimension of M minus uh, K minus ZK is one. So for example, if I take an index one invariant subspace inside of the Bergman space, then uh, taking that to be equal to the K, this will be satisfied because the, we know the closeness and the boundedness and all that. All right, so then we take the corresponding inner function, the extremal function for that invariant subspace with uh, as norm one. And then the theorem says uh, that we can know the, uh, the form of this reproducing kernel uh, by saying it's of the type the phi, this, this inner function here, minus some positive definite uh, u times uh, z bar w divided by, by the term that shows up in the Bergman kernel, if and only if this curious um, inequality on the vectors in the space is satisfied. Now, it's been 20 years since uh, Shimoran proved this theorem, and uh, I know how to prove uh, the equivalence of these conditions uh, to go from one to the other, but how to come up with either one of them, I still have no, no idea. So, I mean, even if you, you say, well, let's take the Bergman space, uh, in fact, um, let's do that. Uh, so, if I take K to be the Bergman space, uh, then this extremal function for the whole Bergman space is just the constant function one. The Bergman kernel, of course, we know what it is. It's one over one minus C W Z bar W quantity squared. And so I should take the U to be zero. And so the Bergman kernel is of this type with uh, a positive definite function U, which is identically equal to zero. And so that means the functions in the Bergman space satisfy this inequality here. Of course, you can verify that uh, by more elementary ways uh, also, because you know you have a power series and, and so on. but it's, it's not that obvious, actually, to, to verify that. Okay, so let's assume this for a while. And, uh, and let's prove um, the theorem of, uh, that I talked about earlier. So first of all, uh, I just said that if we take an index one invariant subspace of the Bergman space, um, then these first three hypotheses are satisfied. We've just proven that every vectors uh, f and g in the Bergman space satisfy this inequality because the whole Bergman kernel has this property. So for any invariant subspace, uh, for all f and g in, in the invariant subspace, that inequality will be satisfied. So that means the reproducing kernel for the invariant subspace will have this form for some u and the corresponding inner function. So remember the kernel for the invariant subspace is a projection onto the invariant subspace of the original kernel. And by that theorem, then that looks like this. And over here, I factored out the phi of z bar um, times phi of w. And so when I do that, I have to divide that term uh, by that. And I claim that uh, once I know uh, this, then these other two things, that namely that bracket phi is equal to m and the contractive divisor property, are actually totally straightforward. And so let's, uh, let's prove that. So uh, first of all, I want to prove that uh, bracket phi is equal to m. And so phi is contained in m, so bracket phi is contained in, in m. That's the trivial direction. I have to prove that m is in bracket phi. We know that lin linear combinations of uh, reproducing kernels are dense in, in m, so I only need to prove that every um, reproducing kernel for m is in there. Now, reproducing kernels, I have a formula for them up here. And so first of all, if I pick a point z where uh, phi of z is zero, then this is identically equal to zero. Actually, I factored it out here, so there might be a problem. But if you look at it here, if you plug in z and w both equal to z, then uh, on the left-hand side, this needs to be positive, and that'll force the u to be zero at that point z as well. And so 
if, uh, if, if phi of z is zero, then the u is identically equal to zero and uh, everything in, inside is, is zero. And then clearly the PMKZ is in, in bracket M. So we'll always just assume that uh, phi of z is not zero. So if phi of z is not zero, then I'm able to divide through over here, at least by the phi of z. Um, this expression here tells me this, since this is an analytic function in W, uh, that means uh, I could solve here for, uh, for the u, uh, the u sub z is an analytic function in W, and when I divide by phi, at least I get a meromorphic function in, of W. Uh, but this calculation that I did over here, when I look at, uh, at, uh, at the z itself, uh, this meromorphic function has to have absolute value uh, less than or equal to 1 because this, this whole expression is, is positive. And so that means that expression is bounded. So any, any possible singularities you have are removable singularities. So, so this expression here for fixed z as a function of w is actually an H infinity function. And the denominator is benign. The phi of z is fixed. So the expression over here is just an H infinity multiple of the function phi. And clearly that's contained in bracket phi, any H infinity multiple is contained in there. So I, I get that the reproducing kernel uh, PMKZ is in bracket phi, and that shows this totally easily. And similarly, for the contractive divisor property, I have uh, this on, on the next slide. Um, that's sort of a general fact about reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. If you have two reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces, one with reproducing kernel K and one with reproducing kernel S, and a function on the set X that these uh, spaces act, then multiplication by this function is a contraction from one space into the other if and only if uh, this expression here, the difference of kzw minus f of z bar f of w scw is, is positive definite function. If you're at all familiar with uh, reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces, you've almost certainly seen this theorem for the case where s is equal to k, so multiplication by f is a contraction operator on on h of k, if and only if, now you can factor out the k, 1 minus f of z bar f of w times k of z is positive definite. But this more general version holds also, and if, for example, if you take f to be identically 1, then multiplying by f is just inclusion mapping, and so then it says the inclusion from um, hs into hk is a contraction if the difference of the two kernels is positive definite, and that's a theorem that uh, Aronjan proved in his 1950 paper. Okay, so, so I want to prove that uh, I have a contractive divisor property, so that's saying that multiplication by 1 over phi is a contractive operator from M to L2A. And so by this, I just have to prove that the difference of the reproducing kernel for L2A and the reproducing kernel uh, for M times the 1 over phi, that this gives me something positive definite. And I have a form for the KZ, that's the Bergman kernel. I have a form for the PMKZ with Shimoran's theorem. I do the calculation, I get this expression here. And the UZW is positive definite. When I conjugate it by just a function like this, that's easy to see, it's also positive definite. And then it's a general theorem called the Shaw product theorem that says that the pointwise product of two positive definite functions is positive definite. So this is positive definite. And so that proves then that the contractive divisor property. So with the reproducing kernel Hilbert space approach, I have no need for biharmonic functions or complicated uh, approximations that I might need to do, uh, at least in the case of P equals two, to prove this, if I understand Shimoran's theorem. Okay, so I go back and I try to prove uh, Shimoran's theorem now in my remaining time. So I've just restated the theorem here, and I will prove uh, one direction of the theorem. So I will prove the direction to go from this uh, estimate on the functions uh, in the space to the form of the reproducing kernel. And then once you see that proof, the, the other direction, if you know your uh, reproducing kernel Hilbert space theory, is, is, is pretty much uh, the same. I'm just reversing the steps. So the first thing I want to observe is that I can define an operator L, and it's because it's a left inverse of multiplication by Z, um, I, I call it L, uh, by looking at the following. So phi is a unit vector, phi is this inner function. So when I look at uh, 
the inner product of h with phi and um, multiplied by the function phi, uh, that gives me the projection of h onto phi. And now phi is, uh, is the vector that spans this one-dimensional case, a space. So when I subtract the projection of h onto that space from h, I end up in zk. So I have a function that's in zk, so I can divide by z and I end up in k. And by the closed graph theorem, then I get a bounded linear operator L. When I look at z times L applied to h, of course, the denominator cancels out. I get h minus uh, this projection term. And of course, h itself is equal to h minus this projection term plus the projection term. And those two terms are orthogonal to one another. So h has norm larger than, than this. So z times L is a contraction operator. All right, so that that's, uh, gets used in the first step here. So I'm assuming now that I have this, uh, this inequality and I apply it uh, instead of, to, I apply it to a function f and I apply it to a function of the type L times g. So when I do L times g, I get an LG here. And so I've now written it, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not doing LG, I do LH. LG is equal to LH. So I get something that looks like this, LH plus zf. So I have this row operation applied to the column vector and the norm squared. And over here, I have the f squared and I have z times g. Well, g is lh, uh, so that's zlh. And I just showed you that the norm of zlh is less than the norm of h. And so I get that this row operator has norm less than or equal to the square root of 2. All right, so an operator on a Hilbert space has norm less than or equal to square root of 2 if and only if uh, x star or x x star has norm less is, is bounded by two times the identity in the order on operators on positive operators on the Hilbert space. So what I get is that uh, two minus the operator L M Z, the row operator times its adjoint L star M Z, the column operator, that's a positive operator. And so when I multiply that out, I get uh, two minus two times the identity minus LL star, MZ, MZ star. That's a positive operator. And now I define my U to be A applied to the reproducing kernel. Anytime I take a positive operator applied to a reproducing kernel, it's easy to check I get something that's positive definite. Remember the reproducing kernel was positive definite, so applying positive operator to it is positive definite. So I have a U, and now I want to Tell me, I need to figure out what this is. So I know what two times uh, that is going to be. I, I also know what mz, mz star applied to the reproducing kernel is. We, we know mz star applied to the reproducing kernel is z bar times the reproducing kernel. Multiplied by z, you get, uh, when you evaluate it at w, you get uh, w times z star at z w. All right, now the operator L was given on the previous slide. And you can do a simple calculation. It tells you that when you apply LL star to the reproducing kernel, you also get something that you can calculate in terms of the expressions that we already have. It's this. And now I can go back. So the U was defined to be A applied to SZ in a product with SW. A was this operator 2 minus this stuff. And I plug in 2 times uh, SZ, SW is uh, 2 SZ at W, LL star with SC, SW was this expression, and MZ, MZ star applied to SC, W is W bar SC. And so when you do all of that, that's what you get. Now you can take the common denominator and uh, you can sort these expressions now. So there's one expression doesn't have an SC in it. The other three do, and I can factor out the SC. And I notice it's uh, minus one minus WZ bar quantity squared times SC. And so I have this, and I solve that for SC, and I get the form that Jim Morin had for his reproducing kernel. So that's the proof of how you go from the estimate in the space to, um, uh, to the reproducing kernel. And going backwards is uh, that, well, as I said, when you know your reproducing kernel properties, is uh, you now assume that the U of Z, W is positive definite. Um, you we then get that this operator 2L L star minus MZ star is a positive operator. And then you, starting from there, um, you can just reverse all the steps. Okay, so this is uh, the proof of uh, 
of Shimoran's theorem. And I'll end here. I, I had two more slides, but uh, as I said earlier, since I uh, added something in the beginning, I'll, uh, I'll just stop here. So oh, thank you so much, Stefan, for three terrific lectures. Um, we are open for business for uh, questions. Um, either put them in the chat or just sh shout them out. I can't keep track of almost 100 people, so. I don't hear do, any. Uh, do we know all uh, invariants of space of index one? Do we know? So, okay, so um, I, I sort of glossed over this thing. So we have some information about what these uh, extremal functions are, if if you have um, if if you have that. But we we only had formulas for for these extremal functions when when we have the one point extremal problems and if, if one point. Uh, zero set. So if you, for example, when you want to uh, to know what the uh, Bergman extremal functions for two points are, I think there was a student of Hook and Hayden Moms that, uh, uh, that calculated that, and that, that gets to be very complicated. You can explicitly get some reasonable form when you have a repeated zero of, of higher order, or if you, you take a limit of that, you get one extremal function of certain invariant subspaces generated by um, by singular inner functions with point masses on the boundary. But the, the real setback is that um, even though uh, we, we have uh, some information about these extremal functions, we don't know what these phi's are. And so when you ask me, do we know what these invariant subspaces are? Uh, the answer is no, because we don't know what the phi's all are. So they're all of the type bracket phi, but we, we don't really know what they are except in, in special cases. Thank you. Um, Stefan, there's a thing in the chat. Oh, yeah, I'll uh, I'll try to locate the the file again to share the uh, the file. All right. While Stefan looks for a file, does anybody have anything else they want to add or comment on? All right, so I have a question, oh. Bill. Can you hear me? I can. Joe. Oh, yeah. Let me ask an unfair question, Stefan. Mm -hmm. okay. going, going back to the point where you get this ratio involving the phi's to be an H infinity function on the disk. Uh, okay. if, if you assume that function, let's say, is univalent. Can it tell you anything about the phi's? Can you unwrap anything from an assumption like you that? Over here? No, no, no. The, uh, it's uh, down here at the bottom, I think. Yeah. Down at the bottom. Mm -hmm. uh, Z, Z bar W, U Z W divided by phi bar Z phi yeah. W. Uh, if, if you assume that for Z fixed, that is univalent in W, can you say anything at all about the properties of phi? I, I don't know. Um, okay. there, right. there, uh, actually, that, now that you bring it up, uh, there is a conjecture that's sort of uh, related to that that had on the slides that, that I didn't do. Um, there's a con question of hidden moms, whether something is, is univalent or even star-like. And if you, if you want to read over the, the last two slides, maybe you, you get uh, a little closer to that. But that, that is a little related to, to what you're asking me, uh, but, uh, but I don't know the answer. All right, any other comments or questions? Stefan uh, shared the file again. So if anybody came in late, um, you can see the file. All right, so let's thank Stefan again for three terrific talks. So, All right, so uh, give us five